This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you all for coming today. We're at the start of Black History Month in the wake of King's birthday, and so it seems fortunate to me that I have this opportunity for which I am deeply grateful to my peers and colleagues to speak with you about poetry, history, and social justice. Much of what I have to tell you is anecdotal, rooted in a personal meditation, but throughout I have tried to tease out the implications of my own experience. I'm reminded of T.S. Eliot's ideas about poets writing about poetry. The poet at the back of his mind, if not as his ostensible purpose, is always trying to defend the kind of poetry he is writing or to formulate the kinds he wants to write. He is not so much a judge as an advocate. It seems to me that all writers at some point must respond to a question posed either by themselves or someone else in order to answer, as Orwell did in his 1946 essay, Why I Write. The first time I had to do this, I was trying to get into a graduate creative writing program, and I needed a statement of purpose. Back then, my father, a poet and professor of English, suggested that I read, of all things, Orwell's essay. I could barely contain my excitement when I sat down with it. His words were thrilling. They seemed to speak directly to me, emboldening me as they provided a scaffolding of ideas that seemed to justify one of my evolving attractions to words. These sentences stood out to me. I cannot say with any certainty which of my motiv motives are the strongest, but I know which of them deserves to be followed. And looking back through my work, I see that it is invariably where I lacked a political purpose that I wrote lifeless books and was betrayed into purple passages, sentences without meaning, decorative adjectives, and humbug generally. Armed with Orwell's words, I know I must have quoted him, I composed my essay. And as I would find out a few years later, barely got into that graduate program. <laughs> a famous poet on the admissions committee rejected the sheet of poems and the statement included in my application by writing on a little slip of paper that I was too concerned with my message to write real poetry. I was lucky that a second poet on the committee on yet another slip of paper had concluded instead that I was young and could be woken up. Later, when I learned of their remarks, I had to look up the word message and ponder the definition. A significant point or central theme, especially one that has political, social, or moral importance. And then I asked myself, what was wrong with that? Hadn't those things always been a part of poetry? Didn't the poems I loved stir in me a moral vision, a sense of empathy, a so of social, ethical engagement? Hadn't I turned to them to learn something about myself, my relationship to the world? The poems of Yeats and Whitman, Auden and Bishop, Williams and Hayden, Brooks, Akhmadova and Hughes. And did I not attend as much to their music, their sound, as to their meaning, the messages I took away from them? What mistake had I made by revealing that political and social and ethical concerns undergirded my poems and gave me a sense of purpose? Discouraged, I began to ask myself what had made me think, beyond Orwell's words, that I should be a writer and that the subject matter that would be my calling was worth answering in the language of poetry. Looking back at Orwell's essay now, 20 years later, I see points to disagree with, and yet, there are still parts that ring true to me that help me make sense of my early impulses and the commitments I have even today. It should be noted that long before Orwell would arrive fully at his sense of political purpose, he discovered, as he puts it, the joy of mere words, the sounds and associations of them, how they could send shivers down one's spine, pure pleasure. In this acknowledgement, I found an echo of my own experience, that moment of reading something that was thrilling in its use of language, and that feeling of delight in the words just for their sound. And later, that feeling of excitement at creating a pleasing pattern of sound stretched along a line, a stanza, and finally, in the lyricism of an entire poem. 
As a small child, I had felt the joy of words in their juxtapositions. In the rhymes and near nonsense phrases my mother sang to amuse me, long before I was conscious of their social or political power. That knowledge would come a few years later when I read, in the fifth grade, the diary of Anne Frank. And the words transported me to another time and place and planted deep in me an empathy for the suffering of people living in very different circumstances than my own. In his essay, Orwell begins by describing the conditions of his early childhood that inculcated in him this notion that he would be a writer. He mentions seeing his father very little and this causing him to be lonely, to develop the lonely child habits of making up stories and holding conversations with imagined characters. I think, he writes, from the very start my literary ambitions were mixed up with a feeling of being isolated and undervalued. I knew that I had a facility with words and a power of facing unpleasant facts and I felt that this created a sort of private world in which I could get my own back for my failure in everyday life. In Orwell's words, I hear the suggestion that the creation of that private world was a way to triumph over the circumstances of one's daily life and I recognize in his experience some hint of my own. My parents divorced when I was a child, and I too rarely saw my father. Only in the summers, that circumstance creating for me a dual existence. Orwell gives a good deal of personal background information in the essay because, as he puts it, I do not think one can assess a writer's motives without knowing something of his early development. His subject matter will be determined by the age he lives in. At least this is true in tumultuous revolutionary ages like our own. And that, before he begins to write, he will have acquired an emotional attitude from which he will never completely escape. Orwell does not make these claims without a sense of caution, warning that a writer must discipline the temperament, effacing the self, though not altogether abandoning those early influences, lest he kill the impulse to write. I am reminded of poet Philip Levine's words, I write what is given me to write. I can see now how much of my own early development as a writer was linked to my circumstances, the condition, place, and historical moment into which I was born and raised. For the nine months of the school year, I lived in Georgia with my mother. In my home, I was a kind of outsider, isolated by my stepfather, who was envious of my mother's previous relationship with her former husband and contemptuous of me, a product of that relationship. Because my stepfather was reading my diary regularly, I began to write knowing that he would see it. He was, in a sense, my first audience, and I carried on a difficult conversation with him that could not be spoken aloud. For him to challenge me on what I wrote would be for him to admit what he was doing, invading that private world of words I was setting down on paper. I began to think then that nothing I wrote could be private, that my words, like Anne Frank's, might speak not just for me, but to and for other people. During the summer months, I went back to Mississippi and stayed with my maternal grandmother. In her neighborhood, there were no children my age, and I spent my days turning inward, like Orwell as the lonely child does, reading, making up stories, and writing them down in the form of poetry or prose, musing upon my own self and my position in the world, mostly in the form of a racialized inquiry, a speculation supported by a kind of rudimentary research. For example, I spent countless hours reading the encyclopedia, and one day came upon the section in the 1967 edition on races of man. There I learned what were supposed to be distinguishing racial characteristics, that if you were white, the ratio of femur to tibia was different than if you were black. In one race, the editors asserted, the femur is longer, in the other, the tibia. I sneaked into my grandmother's workroom to steal away with her tape measure, thinking it would finally reveal to me who and what I was. I was, after all, growing up black and biracial in Mississippi and Georgia, having been born on the heels of the civil rights movement, and I had begun to come face to face with notions of difference and how various aspects of my existence were often issues of curiosity or contempt to many white people I encountered. 
Indeed, because of this, my father had begun telling me at an early age that I had to be a writer because of the very nature of my experience, that I had something important to say. I had no idea what it was, but I wanted to believe that what my father said was true. It would have been impossible then, as it is now, to say, I am going to sit down and write a poem about social justice, though I see now how the hope for and commitment to it pervades every word I write, and it is the lens through which I see the world. As poet Edward Hirsch has written, the poet wants justice, the poet wants art. In poetry, there can't be one without the other. When I was first starting out, my father could have easily directed me to countless other writers and their words. Percy, Bishy, Shelley's poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Keats's principal aims of poetry to sharpen one's vision into the heart and nature of man. James Baldwin's this is the only real concern of the artist, to recreate from the disorder of life that order which is art. Or these words from Faulkner's Nobel acceptance speech, the poet's voice need not merely be the record of man, it can be one of the props, the pillars to help him endure and prevail. These are all ideas I believe in, and, in, and any of those writers might have led me to make assertions about my purpose similar to the ones I made after reading Orwell. When I asked my father about it recently, he seemed amused that he had suggested Orwell and could not remember having done so. Perhaps he had wanted me to encounter Orwell's notion of the four primary motivations for writing and to make a decision about where I stood. Sheer egoism, aesthetic enthusiasm, historical impulse, and political purpose. Orwell asserts that these motivations exist in different degrees in every writer and that in any writer, the proportions will vary from time to time according to the circumstances in which she lives. He describes the political purpose broadly, desire to push the world in a certain direction to alter other people's idea of the kind of society that they should strive after. Furthermore, he asserts that no book is genuinely free from political bias. The opinion that art should have nothing to do with politics is itself a political attitude. Since encountering Orwell's notions of those primary motivations years ago, I have come to understand that though I am in some ways compelled by each one, somewhere between the two of them, between historical impulse and political purpose, is an intersection, a place of overlap wherein I find my dominant motivation, or at least the one that deserves to be followed. It makes sense to me now that I was headed here all along. Everywhere around me in the late 60s and early 70s of my childhood, I saw evidence of injustice. A cross burned on my family's lawn, the poor segregated neighborhoods with substandard grocery stores and higher prices, the clothing stores where my grandmother was not allowed to try on the hats as white women did, all the everyday slights commonplace in people's lives, not to mention the threat of real danger that loomed around us. The list goes on. An overly sensitive child, I committed to, mem to memory King's words, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I thought of Anne Frank. As I grew older, it occurred to me that the world was changing, gradually, and that some of the more insidious forms of injustice were beneath the surface of what I could see around me. Along with the atrocities and overt injustices that came to us nightly on the World News Report, the injustices of day-to-day -day life and the various forms of institutional injustice in housing or education or the courts, for example, were the quiet, ongoing injustices stunningly apparent in the pages and in the absences in the pages of history. And the history of the place from which I'd come, intimate and personal, as well as public and collective, was evidence to me of Heraclitus's axiom, geography is fate. I had been born to the geography of the Deep South, the state of Mississippi whose name means Great River, that river a metaphor suggesting all the hidden history in its murky depths, troubling the surface from underneath. I was born in the land of King Cotton, land of a brutal history of slavery, racism, and injustice, land of violence, lynchings, and murders, one of the poorest states in the nation. 
but also I was born to a place of fertile delta soil, one of the most fertile regions on earth, birthplace of the blues, home to a tradition of writers like William Faulkner, Eudora Welty, Richard Wright, Margaret Walker Alexander, and Tennessee Williams. I have inherited from this geography both great cultural richness and great suffering. I am guided by the words of Henry James, be tethered to native pastures even if it reduces you to a backyard in New York. I am tethered to a place whose Jim Crow laws rendered my family, my people, second-class citizens, whose laws against miscegenation rendered my parents' marriage illegal, my birth illegitimate, not only in the customs but also in the constitution of the state. Thus, I write to claim my native land even as it has forsaken me, rendered me an outsider. I write so as not to be a foreigner in my homeland. I write from a place of psychological exile. I take up the burden of history. I am guided by King's words, no lie can live forever. Social justice depends on social awareness, not blindness, an awareness rooted in both historical knowledge and a contemporary reckoning with the past and its ongoing influence on the present. I write to tell a fuller version of American history, to recover the stories and voices of people whose lives have been marginalized, forgotten, erased, overlooked. I write in order to redress the omissions and errors in history, to confront the will forgetting that haunts our interactions with each other, and to create a vision of a more just society based on reckoning with our troubled past rather than forgetting it. I write because I believe, as historic historian Michael Vorenberg has written in describing the ongoing study of the Civil War, a better, more humane civilization can be forged in the smithy of painful memory, and that by restoring to our collective memory the savagery, heartlessness, and racism of our past, we can allow for the possibility of a civilization based on justice rather than amnesia. How could I not, having been a product of my own tumultuous age, the fate of my geography, its history, how could I not find a sense of purpose in the beautiful idea of social justice? I can say that in my life writing poetry has been a necessity, but I am reminded and so must also say that inasmuch as the language of poetry is about a kind of play, it has also been a privilege, a luxury that countless people in the world do not have. I have always been more concerned with people than with words. Were I to have sent that admission to the graduate program, I might have found myself in the same position as before, perceived to privilege message and meaning over whatever the famous professor believed constituted real or pure poetry. Later, that same professor would say to me, unburden yourself of being black, unburden yourself of the death of your mother, and write about the situation in Northern Ireland. as if Mississippi wasn't enough. <laughs> and also, at another time, ironically, just pour your heart out into the poems. Taken together or separately, there's an insidious implication beneath the famous poet's words, and it is not simply that he could not see or was not interested in what was in my heart. Early on in my journey toward becoming a writer, I was nearly derailed by an unfortunate polemic in contemporary American poetry, a bias that seeks to diminish meaning as part of a poem's twinned concerns of content and form, to foster the idea that poetry is merely autotelic, to dismiss poems with social implications or ethical vision, especially when written by someone from a group deemed other as merely political in the way that word is used to suggest suspicion of a poem's value as pure poetry and to render personal experience as passé. Implicit in the famous poet's statement is that Ireland might make for better subject matter and that he wasn't interested in the particular experiences from which my poems came. It would have been different had he said, master the craft so that you can write beautifully about whatever it is you have been given to write. Instead, he suggests that I write something different altogether, echoing former Academy of American Poets Chancellor John Hollander's notion articulated during an NPR interview that black poets would write better poems when they stop writing from personal experience. 
Elizabeth Alexander, countering this notion in an interview, declared it a particularly dangerous use of the idea that personal subjectivity is somehow passé. She went on to say, I think there is talk which has currency in more than one place that is really saying, I don't want to hear that story. I don't want to be confronted with what that voice is presenting to me. Certainly there are many poets and critics out there who believe that all personal experience is passé. My famous poet professor said as much on many occasions, though I have never heard anyone admi admonish white poets by saying they'll write better poems when they stop writing from personal experience. Often when poets who are from groups deemed other write about personal experience, some readers assume that the poems can't speak to universal human experience, thus imparting the work with a message some readers would rather not encounter. Saying this, I am reminded of the young white woman I met while visiting a small college in South Carolina. Her professor had assigned a book of mine to the class, and when the student read the blurbs on the back, informing her that the book was by a black woman and was about, among other things, black workers in the Jim Crow South, she dreaded reading it because, as she told me, I didn't think it would speak to me because it didn't have anything to do with my experience. She wasn't referring to the fact that the book was about work she'd never done, but that it was about black people. What she initially believed underscores the notion that the experiences of black people can't speak to universal human experience. It's implied on each book jacket that describes the poems inside it as transcending black experience in order to praise them for rising to the level of plain old human experience, as if the two are mutually exclusive. It also implies the notion that only black people and, black, and people from groups termed other experience race. It forgets or ignores that the experience of white people is also an experience of race and that they too write from within a particular racialized experience of the world. Fortunately, that young woman came away from the book with an entirely different view. This, I think, is why so many poets are accused, and it is often an accusation, of writing about political issues, of being too concerned with message whether they intended to or not. I have been described many times as a poet who writes about race, though I can assure you that not only have I never sat down to write a poem on the theme of race, but I also don't consider my poems to be about race at all. That some of them have racial implications or come out of my racialized experience goes without saying. Geography is fate. But as Seamus Heaney has written, to affect the redress of poetry, it is not necessary for the poet to be aiming deliberately at social or political change. I assert, as my famous professor did, that a poet need only pour out her heart. And if a commitment to social justice is what is found there, it will infuse every word the way that one's sensibilities always do. There is a poetic music that can bear the weight of these concerns. Whether these poems are good or not, wrote Denise Levertov, depends on the gifts of the poet, not the subject matter. The implication that certain subjects, thus certain messages, belong in poems and that some do not is present each time I am asked, why poetry? This question usually comes after I have discussed my obsessions, the motivations that I believe deserve to be followed, as though I should have chosen some other vessel for my content, for that which I have been given to write. To that I ask, why not? I believe, after all, that poetry is the best repository for our most humane, ethical, and just expressions of feeling. This is because poetry ennobles the human soul, that it opens, not closes, our hearts. Poetry matters not only because of its aesthetic beauty, but also because of the possibility of humane intelligence, its ability to teach us what we have not known, to show us what we have been blind to, to ask of us the most difficult questions regarding our own humanity and that of others. Across time and space, it shows us how we are alike, not that we are different. It asks of us that we approach the world with more openness than we might employ in our daily lives. It asks that we be more observant, more compassionate, empathetic. 
I write because I cannot stand by and say nothing, because I strive to make sense of the world I've been given, because the soul sings for justice and the song is poetry. What is heartening to me now is the number of writers whose work continues to undertake these noble goals. There are many. For example, the way that Terence Hayes is at once a strong advocate for social awareness and social justice in his poem, A Postcard from Okama, while at the same time gracefully effacing the self, the personality behind the poem's making. A Postcard from Okama. Turn from the camera's eye, hovering between river and bridge, the hung woman looks downstream and snagged in the air beside her, the body of her young son. They are tassels on a drawn curtain. They are the closed eyes of the black boy who will find them while leading his cow to the riverbank. They are the bells that will clang around the animal's neck when it lowers its head to drink. The boy dangles in midair like a hooked fish, his pants hanging from his ankles like a tail fin. On the bridge, women pose in aprons and feathered bonnets. The men wear wide-brimmed hats with bow ties or dungarees. There are three small girls leaning against the railing and a boy nestled beneath the wing of his father's arm. I count 67 citizens and children staring at what must have been a flash and huff of smoke. The photographer must have stood on a boat deck. Though from this angle, he could have been standing on the water with his arms outstretched. He must have asked them to smile at the camera and later scrawled his copyright and condolences on the back of the postcards he made for the murdered man's friends. The Negroes got what it would have been due to them under process of the law, the sheriff said. His deputy had been shot when the posse searched the suspect's cabin for stolen meat. To protect her son, the mother claimed she'd fired the gun. The mob dragged them both from the jail, bound by saddle string. If you look closely, you can see a pattern of tiny flowers printed on her dress. You can see an onlooker's hand opened as if he's just released a dark bouquet. Now, all of Okama, Oklahoma is hushed. Now, even the children in attendance are dead. After that day in 1911, it did not rain again. To believe in God, this is the reckoning I claim. It is a Monday morning, 90 years too late. All the rocking chairs and shopping carts, all the mailboxes and choir pews are empty. I cannot hear the psalms of salvation or forgiveness, the gospel of mercy. I cannot ask who is left more disfigured, the ones who are beaten or the ones who beat, the ones who are hung or the ones who hang. In the, in the precise focus of the imagery in this poem, the flowers on the hanged woman's dress, the hand of a bystander opened as if releasing a dark bouquet, we can see at work Shelley's assertion that poetry is a mirror which makes beautiful that which is distorted. The poet need not take sides to guide us. His empathy encompasses us all. In R.T. Smith's poem, Dar He, the speaker challenges the self, asking a difficult question, not to congratulate himself for asking it, but to reckon with a difficult realization. I, I should probably say, just to remind you um, as you're listening, that Darhi is um, what uh, Emmett Till's uncle said in the courtroom, pointing out uh, the men who came, the man who came to take Emmett away. Darhi. When I am the lone listener to the antiphony of crickets and the two wild tribes of cicadas and let my mind wander to its bogs, its sloughs where no endorf endorphins fire, I will think on occasion how all memory is longing for the lost energies of innocence. And then one night, whiskey and the Pleiades itch from a wasp sting. I realize it is nearly half a century since that nightmare in Money, Mississippi, when Emmett Till was dragged from his Uncle Moe's right 
Wright's cabin by two strangers because he might have wolf whistled at Carolyn Bryant, a white woman from whom he had bought candy, or maybe he just whispered bye as the testimony was confused and jangled by fear. The boy was not local, and Chicago had taught him minor mischief, but what he said hardly matters, and he never got to testify, for the trial was for murder. After his remains were dredged from the Tallahatchie River, his smashed body with one eye gouged out and a bullet in the brain and lashed with barbed wire to a cotton gin fan whose veins might have seemed petals of some metal flower, and Bobo, as friends called him at home, ever seen it. And why this might matter to me tonight is that I was not yet eight when the news hit and can remember my parents at dinner, maybe glazed ham, probably some whipped potatoes, iced tea sweeter than candy, as it was high summer, shaking their heads and passing and saying it was a shame, but the boy should have been smarter and known never to step out of his place, especially that far south. Did I even guess? Did I ask how a word or stray note could give birth to murder? He was 14, and on our flickering new TV, sober anchormen from Atlanta registered their shock while eat, we ate our fine dinner and listened to details from the trial in Sumner. Though later everyone learned the crime occurred in Sunflower County, and Snoopy reporters from up north had also discovered that missing witnesses, two tight Collins among them, could finger the husband Roy Bryant and his stepbrother named Milam as the men in the truck who asked where the boy done the talking and dragged Emmett Till into the darkness. His mother Mamie, without whom it would all have passed in the usual secrecy, requested an open casket funeral, so the mourners all saw the body maimed beyond recognition. His uncle had known the boy only by a signet ring, and Jet Magazine then showed photos, working up the general rage and indignation, so the trial was speedy. Five days with the white jury, which acquitted the foreman, reporting that the state had not adequately established the identity of the victim. And I don't know how my father, the cop, or his petite wife, the den mother, took it all, though in their 80s they have no love for any race darker than a tanned Caucasian. I need a revelation to lift me from this misery of remembering, as I get the stigma of such personal history twisted into the itch of that wasp sting. Milam later told life he and Bryant were guilty as sin, and there is some relief in knowing their town shunned them and drove Bryant out of business. But what keeps haunting me, glass empty, the insect chorus fiercer, more shrill, is the drama played out in my mind like a scene from some reverse to kill a mockingbird or worse, a courtroom fiasco from a Faulkner novel, when the prosecutor asked Mr. Wright if he could find in the room the intruder who snatched his nephew out of bed that night, and the old man, a great uncle really, fought back his sobs and pointed at the accused. His finger, like a pistol, aimed for the heart. Dar he, he said, and the syllables yet echo into this raw night, like a poem that won't be silenced, like the choir of seventeen-year insects, their voices riddling strange as sleigh bells through the summer air the horrors of injustice still simmering. And now I wonder what that innocence I might miss have, might have been made of. Smoke, rhinestones, gravied potatoes followed by yellow cake and milk. Back then we called the insect infestation pharos, thinking of Hebrew captivity in Egypt and believing they were chanting to free us instead of come hither, new science insists on. But who can dismiss the thought that 49 years back their ancestors dinned a river of sound all night, extending lament to lamentation, and I am shaken by the thought of how easy it is for me to sit here under sharp stars which could mark in heaven the graves of tortured boys and inhale the dregs of expensive whiskey the color of a fox. How convenient to admit where no light shows my safe face that I have been less than innocent this entire life and never gave a second thought to this. Even the window fan cooling my bedroom stirs the air with blades. And how could anyone in a civilized nation ever be condemned for narrowing breath to melody between the teeth?
And if this is an exercise in sham shame I am feeling, some wish for absolution, then I have to understand the wave of nausea crossing me, this conviction that is not simply irony making the whir of voices from the pine trees now seem to be saying, dar he, dar he, dar he. In this powerful reckoning, we witness the enactment of Yeats's words. We make out of the quarrel with others rhetoric, but of the quarrel with ourselves, poetry. Because writing about race, or more likely writing from within an acknowledged racialized experience of the world, is too often understood to be what black and other writers do, poet Jake Adam York encounters people who are baffled by his subject matter, the civil rights movement, our shared history of violence and injustice. I've been told, he writes, whether because of my youth or my race, that I don't have to be interested in this history. Implicit in this line of thinking is that the poet has chosen his subject matter, not that it has chosen him, and that a young white poet should find something else to write about. Writing what he has been given to write, Jake Adam York grapples with our shared history as Americans, restoring what has been lost to our collective memory in the elegant language of poetry, thus contending with decades of historical erasure and cultural amnesia. In this poem, which recounts and imagines events surrounding the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham on September 5, 1963, the, com the combined effect of the imagination at work and the documentary evidence that makes up the poem's scaffolding is powerful and haunting. This is going to be hard because Jake's in the room. I want to do justice to his poem. The Crowd He Becomes. Later, he will say he did not do it. He was home at breakfast. Just ask the wife. Say they heard some radio preacher doing love thy neighbor while birds filled up the yard. Later, he will say he did not do it, then tell how he didn't. Lean in close to say if he would have done it, it wouldn't have been alone. He would have had a driver and a man out west to phone in threats to drive the cops away. They'd ease through empty streets to plant their package, then glide away, their route thick with friends. A thousand ways to disappear. The DA will lean, will see his would have dashboard lit, driving dynamite hill, headlights radio dead, would have in the shotgun seat, sticks sweating in his grip, shadows steering through the city's sleep. We'll see them driving out before the paper boys, ready to throw when the dark is right. See him Christmas few years back outside the preacher's house, thin fuse of cigarette, newspaper spread on the bus protests. See flash, shock, push him from the dark, burn his shadow where anyone could see something dark in the lenses of the bottle trees. The photographer spots him eyeing the bombed out church, minutes after a face he's seen before. Flash on the shards of phone booths and bro broken windows. He'll follow through the horrid and the horrified while the cops arrive. The state patrol arrives with bayonets instead of hoses, bayonets instead of dogs, while congregants arrive between firemen and plain clothes clansmen and the children. The children arrive and depart, and there the smirk he'll follow through uniforms and Sunday black into the park, then lose him as it fills. We'll stand in the blur of what arrives and wonder where he could have gone, whether he'd cut toward the depot, through the rail yards to wind back home, or north through the nervous blocks, or circle back for another view, maybe shadowed in a doorway, japing in a sore front window, listening at a sandwich stand while everyone is talking, his work on every tongue. Maybe he could drift through the crush of lookers and cigarette smoke, in the breath of many lungs, innocuous, common, a cloud about to disappear. We'll stand imagining him split at each intersection, now four of him working the city's riot, one with a bomb in his Sunday Herald, one with a gun hung out the window racing to a segregation rally, one with a bullhorn and a speech for the news if they want it right, and one just waiting for some midnight's cool when he can stand beneath the vacant windows and search for that fire in the face of Christ before driving out past the mills. On the ridge, he'll see Vulcan's torch is red, but not for them. 
shadows reel from the furnace sheds, birds exploding, blown from molten light. The mayor says all of us are victims, innocent victims. The lawyer kills his radio. Later folks are asking who did it and the lawyer says, I'll tell you who. Who is everyone who talks of niggers? Who is everyone who slurs to his neighbors and his son? Everyone who jokes about niggers and everyone who laughs at the jokes. Everyone who's quiet, who lets it happen. Now his voice flaps in the rafters of the meeting hall and everyone is quiet. I'll tell you who did it. He says, we all did. The photographer keeps his beat past the crater in the church foundation through the park into the midday rush just where he lost him. In the dark room, he kept arriving, his face framed between elbows, caught in the thrall or his crew cut, his smile cropped by arms. Now his haircut, half roll sleeve, cigarette lip, his eye passed by a dozen times and, and more. He could be anyone, could be everyone, wandering the storefronts, spying behind his news. The, fog, the photographer follows everyone, cocked and ready to shoot, but his lens can't catch them all, so he just stands, tracing their paths. He just stands, lost in the crowd he becomes. In this final line, circling back to the poem's title, we are drawn to consider collective responsibility to our shared history an ethical vision of our duty as human beings to bear witness as the poet does. It should go without saying how crucial the motivation of aesthetic enthusiasm is to all these poets, the heft of certain words on the tongue, the lyricism and rhythm of syntax, and the vividness of imagery and figurative language that can make the mind leap to a new apprehension of things. And these poems have a message. In them, the enduring rhythms of poetry give voice to the spaces that silence has inhabited and oblivion has ruled. Social justice may not be the aim when poets sit down to write, but it can be an outcome. I know which of my motivations deserves to be followed. Thank you. Uh, the question is about um, uh, Laura's talking about a, a scientist who said recently that one can't learn anything from writing fiction. The one can't build knowledge from writing fiction. And so she's asked what I felt like I had learned from writing a poem or build, have I built any knowledge by... <laughs> um, well, I, I think I can answer that a couple of ways. I mean, certainly the easiest way for me to uh, to answer it is by saying that um, I, I tend to to do a lot of research when I'm writing poems and so I'm obviously learning things that I hadn't known before that I find in documents um, in various places. I think that uh, even even in, in listening to, to, to some of the poems I read today we can think about the ways that um, uh, these poets build knowledge around certain things that we may not have known before. Um, and also ways of uh, interacting with the self that we may not have seen before. I think the biggest thing that I learn each time is that I can find, I hope, the best words and best order to convey what seems to me often um, so difficult to speak, uh, what must be spoken but is often hard to be spoken. Of course, I learn something about myself each time I write a poem as well, um, and that is that uh, that store of uh, empathy and that store of the imagination that we have as human beings is inexhaustible. This, the question is about how uh, cinema, how film has shaped um, my work uh, as a poet. I think uh, uh, very significantly um, because I uh, the the image that drives me is always the visual image. Um, I, I attend more to that than I do other images, I think. Um, it is always the, the primary for me. And I'm interested in photographs, and I often write about photographs, but in writing about the photograph, the next thing I must do is to imagine it as if it were 
a, a still in a reel of film and then the reel starts moving and the photograph is animated. So it, that, that's sort of a good analogy for me about how I, I write poems, how I must first see that still and then set it in motion. Um, I also, um, you know, like you said, I have written about, you know, uh, that movie. Um, I admire very much the obsession that films can create for people. Uh, there's a poet named Tino Villanueva who wrote an entire book of poems called Scene from the Movie Giant. And he looks at this particular scene in the movie Giant over and over and over and seems to find a different way to look at it each time. The, the question is about when I know something ought to be a poem or uh, prose. And um, uh, the questioner mentions a, a series of essays that I did that were in the Virginia Quarterly Review about returning to the Gulf Coast um, in the wake of Katrina, uh, going back to my hometown, Gulfport, Mississippi. Um, and as cheap as this sounds, the answer to that is it was an assignment. Um, um, I actually thought that I had, I was finished with uh, the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Um, and then I was asked to go down there and to try to uh, look around and, and think about um, the, the history of my hometown leading up to the devastation of the storm and then the aftermath. I went back again because I got another assignment and this time the assignment was to go down and do the same thing except to write it in poems. And um, I don't know which was harder <laughs> uh, because of the, the nature of it being an assignment. I tend to think most things to me suggest themselves as a poem. Um, prose for me often full, feels like I'm, you know, pulling teeth out of my head, whereas sitting down to write a poem, I get lost in it and it, it's much more pleasurable. I can't think of um, many times, actually I think of, I really can think of only one time that um, there was something I was trying to write about that it occurred to me that this would be better in prose and thus it never got written. And I also think that some of the poems that were part of that assignment, they weren't my favorite, let me just say that. That it was, that perhaps after having examined all that I thought I needed to examine in, in prose, it was hard then to, to go back to some of it and, and find a way to say the same things or approach it like Tino Villanueva did uh, over and over as poems. The, the question about uh, uh, the, the battle cry of uh, my early decision or realization that my, what I wrote could not be private, uh, out of necessity, um, that it would have to be public. Um, and also about the nature of elegy, which is uh, both private and public at once. Um, you, you know, that, that, what happened to me when I realized that, you know, my stepfather was reading my diary and that I, that I had an audience. I didn't want this audience, but I had it. And so, you know, to, to make a decision that there would be someone to hear you and that you could write something directed so that there would be someone to overhear um, did really kind of embolden me and um, it, it shapes the way you shape language. You know, I began to shape language in that way and uh, in that way that was meant to be overheard even at the same time that it was existing within a private space. And so I think I've tried to find a balance always between what is the necessary utterance for me that will also be a thing that can be overheard and meaningful thus to the person who overhears it. Elegy is certainly like that. When I was writing elegies for my mother, they felt so deeply personal. I put them away in drawers for a long time because I thought who would ever care. Uh, it's as if I'd forgotten that um, the experience of loss or grief is a human experience that crosses time and space. I needed to remind myself of that. Um, the public display uh, within the poem of the private grieving I think is probably what invites 
uh, the reader in to empathize and be reminded of one's own grief or loss. The question is about whether or not um, I did any kind of uh, early on in my career study of cadence uh, because there's a way that uh, he could hear that cadence underscored the, the prose as well and whether or not that was a, a literary study or um, whether it was about the people around me. And, you know, I do think it's a little bit of both uh, because before I could read, I could hear the cadences of the voices of the people around me. And, and I think that it was those voices um, that gives me that first sense of rhythm to which I cleave again and again. Um, but then later on, uh, you know, I think I began to be able to hear the rhythm of sentences. Um, I mean, I still do love the rhythm of sentences, you know, uh, even without thinking about a line that you may stretch it along. Um, but definitely the earliest was just listening to my grandmother and to the women who came to her house from the church to have some kind of meetings as they'd sit around the table. Um, my great aunt Sugar taught all the children uh, their, their Easter speeches every year and there were recitations and so there were constantly these recitations going on of, of you know, parts of the Bible or, or other things that the children were supposed to say, and I was taking it all in. And before I would go to bed every night, my father, who is a poet, um, would recite poems to me. I, you know, and this is, again, you know, I was pretty young. I think this is crazy, but he used to um, recite Beowulf to me, <laughs> the part where Grendel is going into the mess hall. Yeah, before I went to bed. It is very much those cadences from childhood, from the people around me. Thank you for your question. And thank you all. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.